Hello again, friends, and welcome to Madison Bookbeat, your listener-sponsored community radio home for Madison authors, topics, book events, and publishers. I'm your host, Stu Levitan. My guest this hour is UW professor and instructor Stephen Wright, author of the new political thriller, The Coyotes of Carthage. To St. Andre Ross, known as Dre, is a talented but flawed political operative who may be down to his last campaign, a low-rent ballot initiative in the backwoods of South Carolina, secretly paid for by a mining company to trick the natives into selling their pristine public land for excavation and despoliation. What happens when the urban black Dre shows up in rural white Carthage County with a quarter million dollars in dark money paid for from that mining company is the business that occupies Stephen Wright in his debut novel, The, Car the Coyotes of Carthage. It is already getting a lot of notice from people who know a bit about creative writing. John Grisham calls Stephen Wright a major new voice in the world of political thrillers. Laurie Moore, whom we used to be able to call, claim as our own, calls Coyotes of Carthage a page turner with a conscience, a burner of a reed with something to say. As to Stephen Wright, well, he has more academic degrees than any guest I have ever had or am likely to a Bachelor of Science and a Master's in Engineering Management from Duke University, a Master's in Writing from Johns Hopkins University, a Master of Fine Arts and Creative Writing from the University of Wisconsin, and a law degree from Washington University in St. Louis. And while in the MFA program, he was a two-time award winner, receiving the August Derleth Prize for his writing and the Jerome Stern Teaching Award which I guess made him the MFA TA of the year. He has made good use of all those degrees, except perhaps the master's in engineering management. First as a trial attorney for the voting section of the United States Department of Justice, now as a clinical associate professor at the UW Law School, co-director of the Wisconsin Innocence Project, and a lecturer in the creative writing program. He has also taught first year criminal law and appellate advocacy. I was sadly not able to schedule Stephen before his appearances at the Wisconsin Book Festival and at Mystery to Me, which you can still see online. So I am very happy to finally welcome to Madison Bookbeat, Professor Stephen Wright. Thank you so much for having me. I, I should just have you come around with me wherever I go and, and just sort of read my introduction. I'm sure it would make my life a lot better. Well, it's, it's, it's a well and varied uh, resume you've got. Uh, very impressive. I don't know what that engineering management was about, but, you know, I, I suppose you, you had to satisfy your parents that you were going to learn a trade. Exactly. That's exactly what happened. Yes. <laughs> so. Before we talk about the book, I should note that we we're having this conversation the, the day after Congressman John Lewis passed away. As a black man and especially as a black attorney who spent years working to enforce the Voting Rights Act, which was, the, after all, the focus of the march from Selma to Montgomery. What do you want to say about what he meant to you as an individual and what he meant to the country as a whole? You know, I, I, I was heartbroken yesterday to, to hear of his passing. You know, I had the great honor of meeting him once. Uh, when I worked at the DOJ, I was part of a team that was reviewing some laws about redistricting in in Georgia and uh, we were actually talking to people and, and that was the first opportunity I actually had to meet uh, Stacey Abrams and she was telling us about why these laws were sort of detrimental and then I remember she said you know what Congressman Lewis will explain it to you and so you know two weeks later you get a call from the congressman and you go and you meet at, the, at, at a big table on Washington DC and I remember he just went around and he shook everybody's hand. And I, and I remember in that moment when he asked me who I was and he shook my hand, that I really was meeting an American hero. I mean, there's so many people, uh, whether it's, you know, Senator McCain or, or Congressman Lewis, who it's hard to sort of believe, but they really did put everything on the line to make the country better. It was an amazing act of selfishness, right? It, to know that you were going to face such obstacles, such violence, quite possibly give up your entire life, all so that the union could be a much better place. And so, you know, to me, that is the ultimate form of patriotism, and we've lost a great patriot. 
And with that background, which has been more agonizing, what the courts have done to gut the Voting Rights Act or the fact that even when it was fully in place, so many people still didn't bother to vote? I mean, it's, it's terribly frustrating, right? I mean, there are so many pressures that exist in the world that distort our democracy. And sometimes it's the laws or the way that the court interprets the laws, but sometimes it's on the individuals who don't get out and actually vote. You know, I, I, I'm reminded sometimes when I go into small towns, and, and especially in the South, and, you know, you have a very low voter, voter turnout. And I'm very mindful that, you know, people die in order to ensure that each of us can sort of cast our ballot. And so, uh, you know, I think it's equally frustrating, both the turn in the way that voting rights have been enforced and have been, um, have been exercised, but also, you know, the turnout continues to be so low. But also, I, you know, I recognize that turnout sometimes is a function of the candidates and the political discourse. And, you know, people don't, people aren't always excited when they look at, look at the state of the world. I don't know if you've been on Twitter to see all the comments about Congressman Lewis, but to see Mitch McConnell and Brian Kemp issue these tributes to John Lewis, it's like the hypocrisy just <laughs> drips. You can see, you can smell the hypocrisy through the internet. It's it's just staggering what that, that they have no, no shame. Uh, speaking of, of your experience at DOJ, how transformative an experience was that for you in personally? You know, it was extraordinary. You know, one of the things that happens in Washington is that on occasion they give very, very young people. And when I started working for the DOJ, I was maybe 25, 26, and they give you an extraordinary amount of power. And they send you to towns and they say, hey, there's a problem in this town and you've got to figure it out. And so it was transformative for me in sort of understanding what actually is the proper role, or at least helping me think through what the proper role of the federal government is in enforcing civil rights. It was important. It taught me a lot just about personal leadership and personal integrity. It also taught me a great deal about the brand of the United States Department of Justice. You would go into towns, particularly in the South, that had a long history of, of discrimination, and they really trusted the DOJ. They thought about the DOJ, the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, and that legacy of, of, of Robert Kennedy's uh, Civil Rights Division, and they really thought that if Washington came, and sometimes they were right, that Washington came, then it, would, it, it could help heal a lot of pain in their community. So, I mean, it, it really did transform me into the person that I am today. Some of us think more of it as Nicholas Katzenbach and John Doerr's Department <laughs> of Justice, sure. uh, and 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 the and the role of the federal judiciary J judges like Frank Johnson, you know, pe people who put their lives and reputations on the line back when the federal government was free, was a lot better uh, than it is today. Uh, now, were you a big voter before your DOJ gig? Would you have voted in all these down ballot races? The honest to gosh truth is no. Um, you know, I think before I joined the DOJ, I could count on one hand the number of elections I had voted in. Um, you know, I think part of it, and it was part of what I was trying to express in the book, is I did not completely understand the importance of local election. And, you know, in, in Wisconsin, I, if I was young and in, and in Wisconsin, I don't know if I would have voted in things like judicial elections or Supreme Court elections, even though that those elections end up being more consequential than any other election, federal or state, in my opinion, on things that I care about, race relations, criminal justice, equality before the law. You know, so many of our cases here in Wisconsin are decided by our, what is a seven member Supreme Court. And they determined, you know, a lot of the constitutional rights you have, definitely a lot of the criminal constitutional rights you have. They, they, do, they do occasionally engage in uh, making law on First Amendment issues uh, or all those type of other issues that I think are sort of sacrosanct to most of us. But I would not have had the wisdom and maturity to sort of understand what was at stake in those elections. Well, a down ballot race is at the heart of Coyotes of Carthage. Now, you are on the front lines of ensuring the right to vote. You've been part of a team that actually freed innocent men from prison. 
why did you write your first novel about a troubled hired gun working on a ballot initiative instead of a noble lawyer working for democracy and justice? Yeah, so, you know, I, I left the Department of Justice in probably around 2012, give or take, and I left be to, to become a writer. And so I was very fortunate to get admitted to the University of Wisconsin-Madison's MFA program. And as you may know, the MFA program is a pretty distinguished national program. It has great professors like uh, Judy Mitchell, at the time, Lori Moore. Uh, you get the opportunity to work with great people like Linda Berry, and each of them in particular, and Ron Kuka has had just been so consequential to not only sort of my experience as a student, but they continue to be a big part of my my life and, and my values uh, that I've adopted for writing. And so it's a two-year program, and at the end of that second program, at near the end of that, uh, I was sort of just, I don't want to say quite listless, but I didn't quite know what was next. And so I think a lot of people were just pushing me towards the novel. And, you know, the axiom of, of you know, writing the novel that you want to read, writing the novel that only you could write, those things, those ideas were really ringing in my ear. And so that's when I came up with the idea to write something that had sort of merged two of my experiences. Um, one was a book that dealt with voting rights. And the second book, and the second experience that used it is I had already started working during my time at the MFA program, um, taking some cases here for the Wisconsin Public Defender in my spare time. So I wanted to merge those criminal law experience and the voting rights experience, and that's where the Coyotes of Carthage came from. But, but why write about an anti-hero instead of a hero based on your own experiences, somebody sure. freeing the innocent and, and ensuring uh, you know, Voting Rights Act, voting rights. <laughs> Because the bad guys are always more fun. Uh, I mean, that's really, I mean, I think there's a couple things. Uh, you know, the, I think the, a lot of the reviews that have come out, I think Publishers Weekly about the Washington Post called it a satire. And I don't know if I would necessarily say it's a satire, but it definitely does offer a, a darker, more cynical uh, view of, of, of local elections and the role of dark money. And I'm not really certain that you can have a hero and especially the expectation that the hero is going to win when you have a novel that just starts from the premise that corporations are going around influencing elections anonymously, which is, I believe, a real threat to our democracy. You know, you can't write that in a, in a way that I don't think ends up just completely uh, ruining a hero and the reader's expectation that the hero's going to win. Did you set it in the South because that's what the plot required, or was there also a bit of emotional payback showing a black man messing with the white community's election and getting back for generations of whites preventing blacks from voting at all? There was definitely the latter. But you know why I set it in South Carolina? South Car I end up sort of getting lucky in South Carolina. Uh, First and foremost, uh, South Carolina has virtually no campaign finance laws, at least on the state level. I mean, there are a couple small regulations, but every year think tanks and organizations make a list of the states that have the best and the worst campaign finance laws as measured by transparency, as measured by outside influence. And South Carolina is always at the bottom of the list. You know, there's a there's a line in the book where uh, Brendan complains that campaign finance, one of the characters complains that campaign finance is like the Wild West. And I really do think that's true. And so South Carolina was appealing to me because it literally has almost no rules. South Carolina was also appealing to me because um, they have ballot initiatives for communities. And so the book is structured around a 12, 13 week election. It's actually pretty faithful. You know, there's some authorial license, but it's pretty faithful to the timeline that it takes to get onto the ballot. And so when I looked at the laws in South Carolina, I saw, you know, X has to happen 20 days out, and something else has to happen 30 days out, and something else has to happen 10 days out. And so I, I saw that and I thought, oh my goodness, I have a plot. Oh my God, I have a structure. <laughs> and so it was a combination of that. And I also thought I could write South Carolina pretty well. You know, I've, I've been in Madison now for several years. I consider it my home. But, you know, in some ways, I very much consider myself a southerner. 
Uh, my family moved around a lot growing up. I was born in Nashville. I graduated from high school in Augusta, Georgia. My family now lives in, in Arkansas. It's the first I lived in Arkansas for about a year. I went to college in North Carolina. So I felt very strong ties to the South and Southern culture. And I knew that I could write it in a way that was at least, at least true to my experience in a way that I hope that people from the South could recognize. And how realistic is the plot? Are these dark money ballot initiatives with straw men and phony issues going on today? Oh yes, without a doubt. You know, I mean, they, they have, Dark money and um, so there's a couple ways to, to I think to look at it right. In some states like California, where the corporations are or have uh, where the laws permit greater transparency, we see organizations like Amazon, the insurance companies, especially the utility companies, using the the ballot initiative process to change laws for their betterment. And we see them spending huge amounts of money. And so oftentimes they create some type of organization that can be traced back to them. But, you know, the utilities companies regularly uh, lobby to, to protect their monopoly. Amazon regularly uh, 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 places ballot initiatives to ensure that, say, taxes remain low or that they can engage in some, some type of labor or or environmental cause um so yeah i mean we i i definitely think that we there's plenty of evidence that at least that these uh, corporations are are using their money in order to influence elections via ballot initiatives south carolina has ironically has had uh some huge problems with this lately and What's interesting about South Carolina is the state is actually struggling with at what point do, does anonymous money become bribery? And so the attorney general there has actually launched several investigations specifically to look at uh, how and where the money was given and whether it ended up being sort of paid for play. Well, one of the one of the little plot twists, in, and it's, it's difficult to talk in too much detail about a novel because we don't want to give away too much, but there's... Sure. But there's one point where the where Dre says, well, you know, the mining company is willing to manipulate the electorate, but they draw the line at actually bribing the city council. Right. You know, is that your experience? It is. You know, I mean, I will say that, you know, when I talk to political consultants who do these things very well or who have a lot of experience, they tell me that they actually want to act within the framework of the law, right? And nobody wants to go to jail. <laughs> um, and so they're often very, very sophisticated in knowing where the line is and when when and where to and how crossing it and what the consequences of it will be. Um, you know, I, it's funny, there is within the political consulting community, there's often ethos, there are often values, and sometimes the profession imposes those ethos and those values to make sure that people don't break the law. Now, ironically, that 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 ethos and the ethics of those organizations, I don't think necessarily line up with the rest of ours. You know, I don't know if anybody necessarily thinks it's a good idea for corporations to anonymously influence elections and policy at the local election, but I do think that community draws a pretty hard line at bribery. And you find that most of the political consultants have the value system that they want to elect good people and they and pursue good issues and they just accept as the price of doing business that every once in a while they'll help a bad person get elected or a bad issue get advanced? I think that's largely true. Right? I don't know if I would say every once in a while, right? I mean, <laughs> my guess is every once in a while they find that one issue or that one candidate that they're very excited about, but they pretty much doing it along the way. You know, the, the political consultants that I know are deeply, deeply competitive people, right? And oftentimes they're very, very bright people. And so sometimes it's just, you know, it, it's the practice of the competition. It's the ability to, you know, go out into a state or, or you know, run a gubernatorial campaign just to sort of flex their muscle, just to sort of learn the experience. And also, you know, you got to pay the bills. It seems to me that part of your purpose in writing the book was to show how big issues filter down to the local level. And 
you open the book with dueling epigrams from Justices uh, Scalia and uh, Stevens in the Citizens United case, which set the stage for what we have now. How would this narrative have played out before or without Citizens United? So, you know, I think most experts attribute the creation of dark money that, and just so everyone knows, dark money we normally are talking about is anonymous corporate money. Corporations set aside money to, to influence local elections, and it's oftentimes untraceable. So most experts attribute the creation of dark money to Citizens United. Before Citizens United, there were caps and, uh, and limitations on the ways that corporations could influence elections. There was a general feeling that money could play a outrageously influential role in our democracy, and therefore the court before Citizens United sort of stood for a bedrock, bedrock principle that yes, corporations and their shareholders, there's a role for them, but let's not allow them to use their money to have outside power and influence. And so the book, frankly, I don't think would have been possible without Citizens United, at least not to the degree that the book sort of reflects. Um, you know, it's one of those type of things where you, where when you write the book and then you start seeing more and more examples in our society of the exercise of dark money, that's something that sort of happened to me a, a lot. Um, you know, the, the process called astroturfing, where corporations form organizations with very innocuous sounding names, and then they fund them with millions or hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars. You know, that has just sort of become a common part of the culture, I think, uh, at least the political culture. So, you know, Silver uh, Citizens United, I, I think, has been a bad thing for the democracy, but the silver lining is it ended up being a good thing for my book. <laughs> so we have to balance these things out. You have to balance those two things. <laughs> uh, I'm going to get back to Dre for a second. Dre has a pretty cynical view of the system. Is that in part because of what the system did to him when he was a, a juvenile? It is. So Dre, we learn, I think on page one, has spent some time as a, uh, when he was young, spent some time in a juvenile facility. You know, I think I mentioned when I was in the MFA program, I also volunteered or I worked for this, uh, I took cases from the state public defender. Um, you know, I come from a family where public service, especially to poor communities of color, is very important. And I had some time, and so I would take some cases, primarily appellate cases, to, to, to represent individuals who were either convicted or facing serious crimes. And I would go to meet them in our prisons. Uh, your listeners know Wapan and Dodge and Stanley and those kind of places. And I would go into them, and there's this thing that sort of happens when you first meet your client as an appellate lawyer, where you just have to build a rapport, you have to build trust. And so you spend some, you spend a lot of time talking about them and their cases, but they end up asking a lot of questions about you. And inevitably, when I talked about having some experience in elections law and voting law, the client would just become terribly, you know, interested. They would want to know all the details about the way that elections work. And inevitably, I think you will ask any, you know, you, you can ask any person who's serving time, the, the thinking was that most politicians themselves are crooks, they're just not behind bars. And so, you know, and I don't think that surprises anybody, right? In our, in our state, not only do we have legislators, but our judges and our district attorneys are elected. And so oftentimes those serving time have real grievance against individuals who have been, uh, who received their power through the, through the election. And so that stuck in my mind a lot. And that's a lot of where Dre came from, where these individuals, um, you know, what would happen if one of the guys that I was representing got out and he still had that cynical view of both the criminal justice system and of our political system, and he decided to become a political actor himself. And the, and the fact that, and that may have actually motivated him to become a political actor by seeing how that system worked. Yeah, um, I mean, like, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's okay. Uh, it, now, is it realistic in... I guess Mrs. Fitz would have to be 
darn near a liberal saint to have hired Dre. I mean, is it realistic that that a K Street firm would have hired Dre with his background? You know, one of the things that I've sort of noticed is that there has been a trend in society of trying to recognize and remedy the damage that juvenile <laughs> facilities can do. You know, even here in Wisconsin, we've had a terrible, terrible experience with the the juvenile delinquent facilities or the youth facilities used used to to incarcerate individuals, uh, young men and young women. You know, we still fundamentally wrestle with these juvenile life without parole cases, the cases where some where someone who was 14, 15 and they committed a crime and a judge sentenced them to life without parole, thus condemning, you know, a 14-year-old to die in prison. I think there's a greater awareness that that just one as a state, but also as a nation, we are we have a terribly imperfect system to address juvenile crime and to remedy it and to prevent recidivism of it reoccurring. And so it, I have seen individuals step up in enormous ways to, to address the issue. Sometimes they're addressing it through policy, but sometimes they're addressing it through individuals. So, you know, I, I, I don't know if I would say, say quite say that um, you know, the idea is entirely fictitious, fictitious, but I would say that I, I think that there are more people waking up to the damage that we do and they want to do something about it. Now, Dre has a sidekick, at least for a while, who is anything but cynical. Is there a bit of the badger in Brendan, someone who's smart and hardworking, but maybe just a little naive? Oh, let me tell you, it's 100% the badger. The, you know, one of the great privileges of writing the book, I would work at the law school from, you know, nine to five, and then I would go home to write. And I I adore my job at the law school. What the best part of the job at the law school is the students. You know, our students at the University of Wisconsin, they are bright, they are hardworking, they are earnest, they sincerely want to change the world, but they're 22, right? And so, <laughs> you know, they are somewhat limited by their life experience about the tools that they know or the, how they go about defining the problem. You know, I, I, I regularly joke with my students throughout the past year that anything that they say may end up in the book. And I think that they thought I was kidding because there are some lines directly from Brendan that actually came straight from my students' mouths. And so, uh, yes, I mean, Brendan, Brendan is, is a badger through and through. Now, when you were in the MFA program, was the first wave program already started at, at Oh My? Was that was that going? Yeah, I think it, I think so. Okay, but you didn't have any contact with it. I didn't. I mean, I, yeah. I I've occasionally met some teachers and some of the fellows who have done it, and it really is an extraordinary program. Um, you know, one of the things that I am very proud of is that you know our MFA program tends to have a pretty not only distinguished group, but they're, they're people with real conscience, right? They're people who are looking out into the world and, and trying to write what they reflect in the world. And they're dedicated to helping other people do it. You know, uh, Ron Kuka, one of the professors there has been involved with the Odyssey program. There's obviously the first wave program. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a genuinely sort of talented and, and diverse group of individuals who are thinking about how to use literature and poetry and prose to make the world a better place. Yeah, I think that first wave program is the most important cultural thing going on in the entire city, yeah. not just on campus. It just blows me away. Uh, let's let's talk about writing, which you've been doing since childhood. What is it that made you want to write? You know, I, I what I think it is is um, like every. I, I suspect the answer is always true for all writers, which is you read something or you watched a television show and you were just inspired. You were like, I want to do that. You know, m my father, um, my father's a doctor, but he's one of those guys where, you know, we'll go out to a new restaurant and then he'll try something. And then the next week he'll just spend the entire week trying to make the same thing at home, right? And so I think in some ways it's the same for a book. You read a book and it really inspires you. You see a television show, you see a movie and you're like, oh, I want to be able to do something as great as that. And what was the book that first inspired you? You know, I, I the, the, it changes at different levels. You know, I, I took some time off from writing when I started practicing law, but I remember reading uh, Marion Robinson's Gilead 
um, when I first started thinking about whether to pursue writing. And, you know, I, I, I have no uh, illusions that, uh, you know, that Marilyn Robinson is a superstar and one would be lucky to even sort of reach that level of talent. But you sort of read that and you're, and I personally was just so moved by it and, and impressed by sort of the storytelling that I looked at and I said, you know what, I, I at least want to aspire to, to write that well. Now, if I'm right, when you were at Duke, you were the editor of the Duke Chronicle, the, the student newspaper, which is following in the very distinguished footsteps of Tom Hayden, who was the editor of the Michigan Daily, and Jeff Greenfield, who was the editor of the Daily Cardinal back in their day. Do you prefer to describe the world as it is or make up one of your own? Uh, I, I'm going to cheat a little bit and say both, right? Because I like creating places. I like creating cultures. But it's very important to me that those cultures and communities have a certain ring of truth, right? So when we were creating Carthage, I wanted to, com I, which is an entirely fictitious place in South Carolina, I wanted to create the type of communities that I had visited when I was in the DOJ. Some of these communities were just, were, were just heartbreakingly despairingly poor. You would go in there and you would go down Main Street, and it's something that I tried to show in the book, and you would not see a single bank, but you would see 10 payday lenders, right? You would not necessarily see uh, a grocery store, but you would see these food deserts where you go to the dollar store and you buy your only source of food is a can of green beans, right? And so I try to sort of show through detail and through the character's experience what those communities actually look like. But the communities are entirely fictitious. And sometimes I'm drawing upon different places and merging them the same way that I do with characters. But, you know, I think the answer is, I think readers best connect to books they don't have to relate to it, but they do have to recognize something that they believe to be authentic. And whether it's a character's motivations or the communities that they live in, that's the writer's duty to create something authentic. Now, some writers know all about their characters before they sit down. Some learn about the characters and the plot as they're doing the writing. Where do you fall in that continuum? So it's important to me to, to sort of fully know or to know as much as I think I can know about the hero, the protagonist of the novel. So I knew Dre's story, you know, most of the way by the time I sat down to write. There was some, you know, in, in the final editing, because things had to be sort of reduced and cut and, and turned around, um, there was some reshaping and reimagining it at sort of the last minute. Not significant stuff, but stuff that was sort of necessary to get the book in, into the right shape for publication. The other characters, uh, Brendan, Miss Fitz, um, you know, definitely the, the people that they meet in South Carolina, I, I had to learn. I had to learn a lot. As, as you were doing the writing, as, as you as I was writing, writing yeah. Yeah. I had to meet with them and I had to talk to them. You know, the interesting uh, things too about, at least for me, for the book that, that um, the book took about four years, four and a half years to write. And when I was done writing, the book, which now clocks in about 320 pages, give or take, the, the final manuscript that I thought was, was perfect and was done was about twice as long. And so I had to show, when I shared it with a lot of my friends and mentors, the, the consistent theme was, you know, it's fine, the characters are good, but it's just way too long. Then nobody's going to want to read a 650-page debut. And so I had to cut it back in half. And in cutting it back in half, um, you know, a lot of side characters uh, left. Uh, some characters were sort of merged. Um, and, you know, a... Uh, uh, a, a lot of the time that I had spent sort of thinking about side characters and, uh, you know, the communities, those things all just sort of went away. Um, and so, uh, you know, those were people that I had imagined on the way and then they were suddenly gone. My last book, I had to cut uh, 40,000 words and you get to the point where you're not even editing. It's just, okay, that whole chapter has to go. That whole section has to go. It's just, 
it'll be a magazine piece in two years, but it's, it's just gone. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you, you probably yeah. thought about this equivalent amount. Yeah, so I think that, you know, the triaging part of novel writing is, is just, I mean, for me, it was just heartbreaking. When I got the note that I needed to cut it in half, I was just, um, I was just sad, <laughs> you know? I, I mean, part of it was it took me four years to write, and then when somebody tells you to cut it in half, you're like, oh, my goodness, did I spend two years <laughs> <Right>. overriding? <laughs> it wasn't even the page count. It was like, that's two years I'm never going to get back. Um, and, you know, it's, it's hard stuff. Like, you know, for me, writing is never easy. So sitting down six days a week for four years, you know, it, it felt like such... Um, it, it, it felt like such sacrifice, you know, the, I am one of those people who the blank page just sort of kills you. Like once you have something on a chapter, you can get going, but starting each new chapter is just, is, is just like pulling teeth. And so, you know, you created these characters, you found these characters, you polished these characters, and then you sort of learn that it was all for naught and you're just sort of heartbroken. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, the, the novel obviously ended up doing fine and I did okay, but you know, part of me is still like, oh, God, I overwrote by two years. The, the thing that impresses me is you did it on spec. I mean, when, I, when I, I, I don't take on a book until I have a contract because I'm too <laughs> old and, and, and too proud to work on spec. But you, what gave you the level of confidence and drive to work four and a half years on spec? You know, I mean, I think it was largely the MFA program. You know, I had, you know, I mean, when when Judy and Ron and Lori Moore and Linda Berry say, hey, we believe in you, there's nothing you can't feel you can't write, right? And so it was really having some outstanding mentors very, very early on who said, you know, Steve, you got this, you can do it, just be disciplined about it and go forth. That, that I think, more than anything else, more than anything else uh, inspired me. But I, I will be honest, you know, there was that moment when you had to cut it in half and that took about six months and you just panic, right? You you just say, you know, there's a, it, it literally crossed my mind every day, what if this doesn't work out? And it just sort of stuns you that, you know, I go from thinking I've wasted the last two years to thinking I wasted the last four years. And that, you know, I mean, I it's hard to articulate. I, I can remember just talking to some friends about it like every day and they were assuring me it'll work out, it'll be fine. But I was like, I don't know what happens if this doesn't work out. So tell me about getting the phone call when it did get picked up. So I was very uh, fortunate. I was able to get a great uh, agent, Kent Wall. You know, the process was, you know, I, let me be clear, you know, after you, after I had sort of a fairy tale experience. I was able to cut the book in half and have it to my friends to read. And once they sort of gave the thumbs up, I want to say I got an agent within a month or two. It wasn't a particularly long process. And my agent had some changes and we sort of played around and I have a great agent, Kent Wolf. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, he sent it out to a bunch of publishers and we got a lot of bites. Uh, Harper Co Echoes at HarperCollins, who we ended up Going with Echo is the prestige imprint. They do a lot of the literary books for um, for HarperCollins. Uh, you know, Simon & Schuster was interested. I think Random House. And so, you know, we got a lot of interest and a lot of people put in bids to buy it. Um, and so, you know, in the end, when that process was done, it was just sort of... Uh, you know, it, it felt real. It felt like, oh, okay, I did it. I made it. And then, you know, afterwards, we 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 sold television rights, and and you know, we started talking about selling foreign rights. And you know, all of a sudden, you're having conversations that when I literally sat right here typing, you know, slaving over a word, you know, you you just hope that your book can go into the world. And then to find out that such people, uh, you know, were behind it. You know, when we got that John Grisham blurb or when we got the Lori blurb, like it was, it, you know, I, I can't tell you how affirming in particular the, the Grisham blurb was for the team. You know, he only blurbs one or two books every year. And when he sort of came back and gave it the stamp of approval, uh, you know, I, it, it, it it's hard to really just to sort of put into words how how grateful and how 
generous he was, but also what it meant for the people who backed the book very early. And w- not to be crass about it, but what do your people say as a rule of thumb a John Grisham blurb means for its commercial success? It, it means a great deal for the commercial <laughs> success, right? You know, the interest, one of the, also the interesting things about the book is, you know, I, um, I, had, I, I have an MFA, so I'm sort of trained how to write in particular in uh, literary fiction, but the book is very, very fast paced and it has an element of the thriller and it has been embraced uh, by not only independent bookstores, but also readers who, who enjoy thrillers. And so, um, you know, what the Grisham blurb did is it affirmed that it could have a place in the thriller community. And, you know, I'm really grateful for that sort of stamp of approval. And you, you say you were nego- talking about TV and, and movie rights. What is the state and, and who do you see in your mind as the <laughs> actors to, to play your, your main characters? Sure. So, you know, I mean, the, the movie rights thing sort of happened very quickly. We were moving along before the pandemic, and then obviously everything just went up into the air. Uh, the, the team that produced House of Cards for uh, Netflix is the team that uh, bought the movie rights. They, uh, the team at Calvary, they have been extraordinary and they've been very kind. You know, they, they are, they are so, uh, I'm so grateful that they choose to include me in this. Uh, you know, but sometimes I have conversations and, and they're talking about sort of television stuff. And I'm like, I didn't even know those words existed, <laughs> let alone you're now using them in phrases and clauses. But so I, I, I've had the opportunity to sort of learn a lot. You know, I don't know uh, who might play. I, I imagine Michael B. Jordan would be a great Dre. Um, you know, I'm not exactly certain who would play Brendan. You know, I mean, the problem with Brendan is that I act, like I said, he's based upon one or two, he's based upon my students. So there are a couple students who I would who I would cast <laughs> in the role of Brendan to play that role. So, uh, so yeah. Now, do you want to, do you want to write any more about Dre and Brendan or are you done with him? You know, I, I think I'm done with them, at least for now. Um, you know, there's a possibility that they might show up in a short story or two down the road. But, you know, I've already started some other projects, uh, some other novels. And I think, uh, you know, I think Dre and Brendan are gone. You know, the, the, the hard part, I'm sure, that every novelist tells you is, especially when you live with characters for like four, four and a, four and a half years, it's hard to get them out of your mind. So, you know, even even today, like, uh, or even in these days, you know, I literally just was sort of sitting on my back porch and I was seeing something. And, you know, from time to time, I asked myself, you know, what would Dre or Brendan be doing during the pandemic? Like, it, it's just the thought that just has to enter into your mind when you spend so much time with the characters. And so, you know, you see something out in society or you, in particular, when you see these Black Lives Matter protests and the protests over the murder of, uh, the murder of multiple black men. Uh, you know, you're you're sort of like, you know, well, how would how would Dre respond to this? So, well, speaking of the pandemic, the book came out in early spring, just as the pandemic was shutting everything down. You no doubt had a pretty ambitious book tour planned. As a consumer, I actually like the couch tour life because I can sample, you know, things from all around the country. Uh, but it really isn't the same. How much do you miss getting to fly around the country doing all these book things? And how much is it sort of a relief that you don't have to go through it? It's probably equal parts. You know, I mean, uh, we were very lucky very early. Um, The book came out in April, but we got a lot of very positive feedback in November when we sent out sort of the early advanced copies. Uh, We got a lot of very uh, generous and enthusiastic support from independent booksellers. So our strategy was, I believe, a two, maybe a three week book tour of just going around to independent bookstores around the country. And let me say, I, you know, I've never met an indie bookstore owner that I didn't didn't end up actually adoring. And so the prospect of going around the country and meeting people who, you know, supported the book, who enjoyed the book, who wanted the book to succeed, and to helping them in turn build a community, that was very, very appealing to me. The idea, however, of, you know, getting on a plane at 6 a.m., flying into a new city, uh, doing the book tour, doing the dinner, signing the books, going back to the hotel, sleeping, then waking up in the morning, doing the, the whole thing over in a new city, the traveling part of it was not was not something I was terribly enthusiastic about. And so, you know, in some ways it's the, it's the perfect world. You know, I will say that 
um, you know, we had our book launch, uh, I think on April 14th, and it was here with the Madison Public Library. And, you know, it's sort of a tradition, I think, in the MFA Wisconsin program for people to come back and to have that. And so I was really, really excited with so many uh, friends and supporters and, and colleagues from Wisconsin were going to be able to participate in the in the book tour and for us all to be in the same room for the book launch. And then I was disappointed that it was going to happen. But then I started to see who was sort of volunteering to sort of show up. And so many people from my life, my you know, not only my parents and my sisters, but old old girlfriends, uh, friends from school. Everyone just sort of came together, I think, for that August, for that April book tour. And so I was able to build a community that wasn't bound by geography, that I was able to sit and talk about the book with my friends Ron Kuka and Laura Coates from CNN and just have that and be able to share that with the world. You know, it ended up, I think, being a blessing in disguise. I want to ask about the title and the book covers. As people can see from the cover up there on the shelf behind you, uh, it's very interesting. If you look closely, you see that it's trees and hills and representing the landscape that would be ravaged by the mining company. But if you step back a bit, the trees assume the posture of a coyote sort of howling in the night. And it's a visual double meaning. How much do double meanings and especially alliteration play in coming up with the title? You know, the title's interesting. We talked earlier about Justice Scalia and Justice Stevens back and forth in Citizens United. And so the original title actually came from a quote there. Uh, you know, as we discussed before, Citizens United is part of where we come up with the, this question of whether uh, whether corporations are people. And obviously Justice Scalia is on the side that they are. And he makes the argument in Citizens United that uh, that that's a long part of our tradition, dating back to the founding of the founding of the country, that corporations and people were almost indistinguishable. And Justice Stevens has somewhat of a, a, a smart alecky retort, saying, you know, this isn't the history of our country, and you, Justice Scalia, are not the uh, are not the guardian of ancient values. And so for a very long time, the title of the book was The Guardian of Ancient Values. And I was really, really excited about that. But no one in my life liked it. Everyone just said, that is the worst title possible. <laughs> and then... And then I, I Sounds like a somebody, science fiction title. Well, that was exactly <laughs> the problem. They thought people would confuse it with Guardians of the Galaxy, which was a big blockbuster hit for Marvel around that time. And it remains a big part of, a part of, the, part of the franchise. So... You know, I, I think people were concerned about brand confusion and also, you know, that it, that it would not uh, that it would not tip off people at all what the book was actually about. And so we wrestled with a series of, of titles, I think over two or three, we had some more in between and nobody really liked anything. And then I think it was my agent who suggested the Coyotes of Carthage. Um, and, uh, you know, the Coyotes play a huge, I don't want to say they play a huge role in there, but, but they are part of a motif that that's is threaded throughout the novel and they play different roles and have different meanings and so tying that to the town of carthage and the alliterative effect i think ended up being why we decided to go with the coyotes of carthage did you always know how coyotes were going to figure into that last scene i did uh you know the the some parts of the ending uh, went through a, a couple different changes, but I, in the end, I knew that I wanted uh, Dre alone with the coyote in, in that final moment. And, and there's a certain amount of ambiguity about exactly what happens at the ending. Mm -hmm. uh, did it, how, how many iterations did that ending go through? You know, that, that, so the ending, I think, ends up being like 10,000 words. I think the past, last 2,000, 2,500 words didn't change very much. Um, the, the, the challenge with the ending is um, I, I wanted the book to have sort of the feel of realism in the sense that, yes, Dre... Uh, competes in the election, and we know by the end, uh, or at least, uh, you know, we're, we're gesture towards how the election actually goes. 
but Dre's got a lot going on in his life. He's, you know, his brother is dying. The woman he loves has left him for another man. There's a great deal of uncertainty in his job. And I just didn't think it was true to life to have any of that sort of wrapped up in the moment, right? Each of those things will play out across a character's lives for sometimes it will just be a short amount of time and sometimes it will be a much larger amount of time. So in some ways I feel like the plot, the, the in terms of understanding the way that elections work and understanding how this campaign worked, um, I think that ties up nicely. But I do understand, uh, you know, the biggest critique is that those sort of things in his personal life uh, some folks found how how uh, some of those things weren't quite resolved, a little bit frustrating. Well, that gives you something to get back to down the line. It does. Because you could right. get exactly. an answer down the line. And, and speaking of down the line, we, we've got about a minute and a half left. We, you got TV rights happening. You got, you know, book contracts. Is the University of Wisconsin Law School and creative writing program going to have to fight to keep you? Or are you, <laughs> are you here for the duration? You know, I I will say this. I, I I hope that I'm here for the duration. I I have such warm colleagues both at the law school and the creative writing program. I can't tell you when the book came out how many kind letters and letters of support I got from uh, from everyone at the university. The chancellor herself wrote, read the book and she wrote me a very kind note. The provost did the same. So I'm really grateful for the support that I received here at the University of Wisconsin Madison. And you expect to stay. I hope to stay. Yes. Well, we we hope to have you. And and uh, now, do you have a contract for another book, or, or do you have to go start all over on this process? I have to start all over on this process. You know, part of the challenge was this book took me four and a half years, and I didn't even have an idea for a second book at the time. So I was afraid. You know, with with contracts, you normally have to get the book out within two or three years, and I just didn't know whether I could do that. So, you know, Echo and Harper Collins was very, very kind and very, very supportive in offering me a second book deal, but I declined just because I didn't know whether I could do that. And do you have an idea now? And are you started now? Or are you still scouting around? I started writing the second book, yeah. Okay, well, um, hopefully I'll still be here when, when it's out. <laughs> hopefully we can we can have you back. I, I'm afraid that is all the time we have. My thanks to Stephen Wright. Again, the book is The Coyotes of Carthage. Next week on Madison Book Beat, a conversation with Larry Tai about his new book, Demagogue, The Life and Long Shadow of Senator Joe McCarthy. Larry will be doing a virtual presentation at the Wisconsin Book Festival two nights later, but you get him here first. One book event this week to tell you about our friends at Mystery to Me Books, who will be presenting award-winning writer S.A. Cosby in conversation with our buddy Doug Moe, whom Stephen was in conversation with in April, about his new novel, Blacktop Wasteland. You can find more information at mysterytomebooks.com. For now, on behalf of News and Public Affairs Director Shali Pittman and everyone here at Madison Bookbeat, I'm Stu Levitan. Thank you for listening. And now, as Ben Sidron plays out with a little bit of Little Sherry, please stay tuned for Alex Wilding White and All Around Jazz. You are listening to WORT 89.9 FM Madison, listener sponsored community radio. And we are out. Excellent.